Hi, I'm Simon Ewing Jarvie. And I'm Heather Roy. Today, episode five is about questions, the ones that the audience have been sending in. Thank you very much to you all, and we'll get through as many as we can. Some of them need to be spaced out a little bit so that they align with um, other topics that we're doing. Yes, anyway. which actually takes us back to season one. It does. Mm. Yeah, so those of you that want to know all about the parties and their policies, it's just a little bit too early in the electoral cycle yet to... Um, have, it, have all that together but if you're really hanging out to know about the individual parties and what they stand for in general terms you can hop back to season one and there's an episode on on each of them yeah we also looked at um, MMP mm. uh, explained and um, so there might be some other areas of interest there too right so what have we got question was first question is for you Simon it's from Amelia from Nelson mm -hmm. and she would like to know what top stands for Oh, okay. I'm not sure whether she just wanted to know what TOP stood for or a little more understanding of the party, but yeah. how did you take that question? Because okay. we were going to yeah, we were going to do a whole episode on top and there's a little introduction in the minor parties in season 1, but I can I'll just talk a little bit about it. It does stand for the the Opportunities Party. And it's an interesting uh party to try and describe because I don't think we've really seen enough of it yet to really get a handle on it. There's no doubt in my mind that it's a liberal party. It's got a whole heap of new ideas, um, and and you go on their website and they they openly sort of talk about the unsatisfactory outcomes that both Labour and National over the years have um, have been able to achieve, and they they've got three strands of of policy. One's about tax, and uh, one's about infrastructure, um, housing, and one is about climate. And then you, you can click through there, so it's top.org.nz and that takes you to some bullet points of policies where it expands in a little, a little more detail. They've got some really quite impressive candidates, um, certainly on paper. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from, from them as we roll into the election too. Yeah. yeah mm. I mean, it, it's hard to say, I'm finding it hard to position them on the economic spectrum mm. yet. Most of what we've seen so far is about, so there's some higher tax brackets proposed for people over... Uh, 180 and 250 thousand yep. dollars. They um, want to lift the company tax rate. Yeah, lift the mm. company tax rate from 28 to 29 cents. Uh, they've got a teal card proposal, which is mm. about basically you do some civ civic service in one branch of state and you get five thousand dollars savings or Kiwi Saver put in. So there's there's a lot of focus on people, you know, under 23, under 30. I think that's great, mm. but if it's just about redistributing wealth from the perceivedly rich um, I, I'm not sure that that puts them anywhere other than in the state run side of the economy yeah. and the other thing to watch of course is the Islam electorate where Rafe Manji their leader is running mm. um, at the moment they're polling anywhere between about 1.5 and 3.5 percent so mm. not enough to get them across the 5 percent MMP threshold uh, and so it looks at the stage anyway that they'll be dependent on winning that electorate. So mm. there'll be a lot of activity there. Yeah. Mm. So Amelia, I hope that sort of answers your question at this point. Um, we'll do a whole episode on each of the parties later on in this season. Mm. So next question, where's that from? The next question is from Finn in London. <laughs> Is Winston Peters going to be re-elected? <laughs> well, that's, that question actually highlights a, a big part of the problem, really. We don't think about New Zealand first. Uh, we think about Winston Peters, and he's been part of the political landscape in New Zealand for so long now. Um, yes, and we haven't really got time to go into all of that. Is he going to be back? That's, that's a hard question, Finn. Um, you can never, ever write Winston Peters off. And so there's always the possibility of him getting back. He'll stand up a couple of weeks out from the electorate, election and um, hold up three fingers and say, these are his three policy planks. Uh, and that will attract a portion of the population. My instinct this far out is I don't think he's going to quite get across the line. Mm. But we've still got several weeks to run. And that Winston political instinct and charm machine yeah. um, certainly counts for something with the electorate still. Hmm. Um, and in some ways his future's connected with Shane Jones and the Northland electorate, isn't it, whether he can lift that again? Yes, yes, it definitely is. I mean, Shane Jones has been a cabinet minister, was a Labour MP for a long time too, um, and is certainly... He's a good talker. He's a good talker, and he, he knows politics inside and out. Hmm. So watch the space, really. Yep. 
Um, Jeremy from Ashburton has sent us this question, which is a very good one, Jeremy. What is an overhang? You've talked about overhang in one of your podcasts, and I'm not really sure what this means or what the implications are. Okay, cool. So there's 120 MPs in the Parliament normally, and they're made up of elected MPs and list MPs. So everyone wins their 70, is it 72 electorate seats? I think it's 72, yes. And then, so then you've still got, what's that, 48 left uh, to make up from the party lists. The the number of MPs that a party is entitled to is based on their party vote, not on the electorate vote. So when you get a situation where the electorate, the, the party wins more electorate seats than their party vote would justify, that creates an overhang. So, for for example, if you were to win two seats, and the Māori Party has done this, created this situation in the past, you win a whole heap of electorate seats, and they potentially could win up to you know three or four in this election, but only get two and a half percent party vote, which would only entitle you to two. That creates a parliament of one hundred and twenty-two. So that's the overhang. That's Anything the above one hundred and twenty seats. Yeah, mm. and we've had one hundred and twenty-one, not uncommonly yeah and the only real difference it makes other than having to put a couple more seats in the debating chamber and that happened when the Maori party uh, did create the first overhang uh, is that to get a majority mm. you need to get 61 rather than 60 uh, 62 yeah. yeah so yeah it just makes it that much harder for a government to get across the line to yep. which we could see happen at this election yes we could um Maori parties is the best example, and at the moment they're polling anywhere from about one to two percent, mm. up to the one poll recently had them at eight percent. So yeah. they'll be somewhere in between. But if they hold their two seats and potentially get one more, which is what some pundits are thinking might happen, and still only poll in around two to half percent, there will be an overhang. Yep. Okay. Right. Okay. And the last question is from Cassie from Wellington Central. All right. Um, She says, uh, I've got a friend who loves politics. He keeps talking about hard left and hard right. We did touch on this, Heather. What do you think? (laughs) We did. Um, Episode two was on the political spectrum, and we talked about the one-dimensional way of thinking about politics that the media particularly talk about. And so they talk about the centre of politics. They talk about centre-right, which means basically that's code for National Party. They talk about centre-left, and that's code for Labour Party. Uh, And they tend to imply, therefore, that the Greens and ACT are the best examples, Greens being hard left because they're way over to the left-hand side of the political spectrum, and ACT being hard right because they're further over to the right of the political spectrum. We really don't like this way of describing things. We don't think it's an accurate way or doesn't portray the right message about what the philosophies of the parties are. And we like to think about a two-dimensional axis where you look at um, socialist or state-run versus free market um, or capitalist view of life. And then the other the other axis on, on our two-dimensional spectrum is liberal or new ideas versus conservative or traditional ideas. So if you'd like to go to our YouTube channel, you'll see that we have there um, both our podcast but overlaid on, on a graph that explains these things more uh, more succinctly and uh, more visually. Mm. So by talking about hard left and half right... Your friend's probably talking about green-type politics and act-type politics, but actually I think our best advice is probably just tell him you've no idea what he's talking about and ask him to explain because we're trying to guess what he's thinking in his head and it might be quite different. Yeah, I think when you use terms, you know, emotive terms in this sense like hard, you are really um, implying something negative and it comes across often as um, authoritarian. Yeah, but you can have authoritarian capitalists and authoritarian socialists, so it's kind That's of meaningless. Right. It's dangerous territory, sort of applying labels to everything when there's no clear understanding amongst everybody what they mean. Mm. And one term that particularly annoys me is neoliberal, mm. which, if you do a direct translation, means new liberal, a mm. new new way of thinking about things. But it's used in a very derogatory sense by many mm. to, to actually mean hard right. Yeah. And, and why are there no neo-socialists? There they was a movement, be. I think, in France at one point. They tried to create. There was a split 
in the Socialist Party and they create they called themselves neo socialists. They yeah. didn't last yeah. long. But so, using using democratic process to implement uh, socialist policies is a finch is essentially neo socialism. They call it social democracy, social yeah. democrats, but same thing. So you can get wrapped around the axle about the language. It's more important that you actually listen carefully to what people are offering and how it affects you and vote accordingly, what you, what you think is best for you, what you think is best for the future. Yep, that's right. So those are the questions that we've had so far that are relevant to what we've been talking about. Thanks very much for sending those in. So thank you, Finn, Amelia, Cassie and Jeremy. Uh, but we'd love more questions too. If the things that we're t- telling you about that aren't clear, please let us know. We'd like to have the opportunity to discuss them more with you. Yeah, and for those of you that sent in policy-specific ones, like we've got a few on national security and the like, don't panic, they're coming. Yeah, um, send, send them in through the context page on the TalkPoint website. That's T-O-R-Q-U-E point, talkpoint.co.nz, and we'll um, put them in the, in the queue for another episode. Right, that's us for today, I think. It is. Thank you. I'm Heather Roy. I'm Simon Ewing-Jarvie. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.